Welcome to the dream boat. Remember, you can join the DRI for just £10 a year until the end of June 2023. And you get access to more content, including videos and discounts for our events. It's a great way of finding out more about our work, joining our dream community and supporting this podcast. Details are in the show notes. Welcome to the Dream Boat Podcast, a place where we talk about everything dreamy. All you wanted to know about dreams and where you might find some answers. My name is Dave Billington, and I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm also director of the Dream Research Institute. And I'm joined by fellow psychotherapist, Laura Payne. Hello, I'm Laura Payne, and I'm also part of the Dream Research Institute. And we're called the Dream Boat because we are actually recording our podcast on a beautiful canal barge here at Little Venice in London called the Boat Pod. We'll be looking at dreams, talking to guest experts, and answering your questions. Now, let's get on with the episode. In the first series of the podcast, we often mentioned the Jungian approach to dreams and and used terms like psyche, archetypes, and the collective unconscious. Yes, and we also considered another major aspect of uh, Jung's work, the shadow, and how it appears in dreams, as well as figures that might represent the feminine anima or masculine animus qualities. But today we are joined by Jungian analyst Roderick Peters, who can bring greater meaning to these terms and explain in more detail the Jungian approach to dream interpretation. Yes, it's a great pleasure to invite Roderick on board. Roderick comes with 40 years of dream work as a Jungian. He once worked in a dream lab as a doctor and has written books including Living with Dreams as well as some fascinating papers and he lectures extensively also on dreams. So Roderick, welcome. Lovely to have you on board. Thank you. A remark to amplify what you've said. For reasons unknown to me, of course, I have been fascinated by dreams since my early infancy. So, and they they intrigue me so much that um, I have really sort of paid attention to dream my own dreams. This is on a, uh, a pretty much a daily basis for seventy nine, well, seventy six years now. Wow. Uh, there was a particular dream I, I think I've read in some of your uh, some of your work that you mentioned that you had when you were a three year old. Do you want to tell us about that? In the dream, I was something tiny. I mean, tiny like a grain of sand or a speck of dust. I don't think I really had the capacity to be able to move. But certainly the feeling was of of a kind of tiny helplessness. And I was on a a sort of a flat surface, which I can convey the idea of it a bit by saying like a desert. But it was actually, there wasn't a sense of kind of warm coloured sand or anything a flat surface which felt as if it stretched infinitely in every direction. And above me was a some kind of an entity, a an existence, a reality, which felt almost like the same surface that I was on, except it was above me. And the prevailing sort of um, subjective experience in the dream was of um, a tremendous sort of fragility of existence, as if to a thing which had been a one thing had opened up a space within it so that it was now a two things and there was a space between them, and that was my sentience, my existence. Uh, But it felt very, um, very uncertain Mm. uh, indeed. I think you talk about the sense of existential dread that accompanied this dream. 
Yeah, I, right. <laughs> Sorry. I, I did. And actually, you know, just over these last days, thinking about it, wondering whether to bring it in to, to yourselves, what occurred to me, and it sort of feels true to me, is that I don't know, but I guess that in the very early months and years of life, there are probably dreams of a very archetypal nature which are communicating the very beginnings of what later become philosophical and psychological theories and hypotheses and things that are sort of important realities of life that, that people give a lot of attention to and that they come first of all in an imaginal and subjectively experienced form. Um, and that it's just that I, as I say, for reasons unknown, remembered it and, and it left a, an impression on me that's stayed all my life. Mm -hmm. Sounds a very powerful dream. What do you think uh, Jung would have made of this dream out of interest? How would, how, what would, uh, yourself as a, uh, as a Jungian, how would you, if somebody presented this dream to you, what, what would you say? Well, actually, I would say just what I've just been <laughs> saying. Um, <laughs> so that, that's what I now make of it. Uh, I, but I, I need to add to that that for decades I've, continued to wonder what to make of it. You know, I, I've wondered, my father was shortly to come back from Burma where he was a doctor in the RAF fighting the war. Uh, my mother, even though I may not have known it consciously very much, would have been, I'm sure, in a very disturbed state with the war altogether. We'd had to leave London and go somewhere safer. Mm. Um, she was, you know, probably very worried about whether her husband would return. Mm -hmm. And and maybe there was, you know, some mm. sense of the opposites of mother and father, of masculine and feminine in this space that had opened up from a, a one thing. So that, that's one thing I thought. And... And then thoughts to do with the very beginning of the phenomenon of consciousness, you know, a kind of a different story from the story in, in Genesis. Um, and this story would, would be that the, um, if there has been a pre-existing state of oneness uh, without a, any kind of, conscious or individual separation, then as that first appears as an evolutionary development um, or is kind of recapitulated in each individual at birth, mm. it does maybe come with a, a, a terrifying sense of a little fragility um, in a world of immense energies. Um. I like that. I was thinking uh, when I read it uh, and he just hearing you talk now that I wonder how many uh, young children, you know, I'm talking of babies through, as you say, three, four, before we start getting hold of bigger, greater concepts of the, of the mind as such, have dreams like this, which are almost like prototype collective consciousness dreams. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Uh, I I don't know, of course, but I, I, it feels right to me that that probably does happen as mm. a part of the... Um, the getting used to... Consciousness. I mean, I think the, uh, well, as far as I know, the prevailing um, hypotheses, guesses of, of human developmental psychology uh, are that the, um, the initial state is a, uh, a kind of a, a confused 
virtual oneness of infant and mother mm -hmm. where what who begins where and who ends where mm -hmm. is unknown and mother actually represents life the world and the universe being represented in this particular this particular human individual who's executing the role of mother and that if if that is right then uh, it is going to be out of that state that I gradually sort of coalesces and begins to be experienced as a singular unit um, so if you know if if there's anything right in those ideas of very early life then I'm certain that there will be dreams that are imaging it and and helping it to come about mm. yeah um i i think that's right i wonder you know the study of uh, it's almost a subject really for a, a separate podcast for us as, as looking at children's dreams i know that you went on like your father and trained to be a doctor but then you became involved working with a sleep lab i understand and is mm. it is it that that prompted you to become a jungian no i had been working uh, abroad at, there was a moment when I decided to become a Jungian. I had returned from my daily work at the small hospital, and it was my habit at that time to go to the swimming pool, smoke a joint, and just sort of lie and lounge about in the warm water under the warm Nigerian sky. And I was reading Jung at that time. I was fairly close to the end of reading through the full collected works. And lying on the edge of the swimming pool, it came to me almost like a bolt of lightning that actually what talents I do have in life would be more completely employed in working with the psyche than working as a doctor with, you know, the body as a whole. Mm. So that then led to a period of saving up money and making plans and so on, which lasted a few years. And when I came back to England, I left my sort of um, hospital uh, cardiorespiratory medicine and um, and went in, decided to get some experience in psychiatry mm -hmm. and went to the Atkinson Morley Hospital in Wimbledon under a Professor Chris, who at that time was, um, he, he was one of the country's leading experts on eating disorders. And there were two wards there full of young people with really serious problems from eating disorders. And he had a kind of a sideline going, being a professor, you know, he was, research is expected of professors. And he had been struck by how many people claimed that they didn't sleep at all during the night. So he created this sleep lab where people who believed they weren't sleeping at all could come in and were all sort of wired up to, with, you know, what measurements were capable of being made in 1978 or 9. And, and one or other of the doctors would sit in with them and watch these uh, metrics. And if they did wake up, uh, well, I at least, I'm not sure whether the others did, but I would always ask if they'd had a dream. And um, so I, I was kind of paying attention to dream as well as sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and did they? Were dreams quite yeah. interesting? Almost always when, I mean, first of all, these people were sleeping very badly, but, they, you know, there were, there were periods of sleep. And when they woke up, almost always they were right in or just emerging from a dream. And, and I asked if they would tell me the dream, and often they did. And quite often the next day when they were sort of fully awake, 
they they remembered talking to me, but they had no recollection of the dream at all. Um, Very common. Yeah, I've, we, we, Dave and I often hear this. People yeah. recount that they wake up. They, I think you call it, you know, they might not know the dream, but they know they were dreaming. And I like yeah. how you differentiate between the two states. Mm-hmm. So what was Jung's take on dreaming? Well, it was important to him, wasn't it? Oh, very much so, yes. As indeed it has been with uh, Freud. Um, you know, they, uh, Freud said that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious and uh, Jung, who, you know, disagreed with Freud on many sort of ways of envisioning the psyche and how it works, but that was one thing he did completely agree with Freud about. And um, your question was, what was Jung's take on dreams? And why was it important to him and for Jungian analysts as well? Why is it important part of your work? Right. It is, of course, quite a big question, and my answer will really uh, summarise a great deal. Sure. The most important sort of underlying premise is that uh, the psyche is not only the conscious psyche that our eye knows, and that there is psyche uh, below, around, and above conscious psyche uh, of an, an extent which is unknown, which he and Freud call the unconscious psyche. Uh, Jung... Uh, came to believe, and I share that belief, uh, that the um, the unconscious psyche is not, as it were, a completely disorganized uh, jumble of psychic energies, but is organized in the same way that the body has organs and therefore is organized and that the organs of the psyche are the archetypes. The word archi means oldest or earliest, and type is from the Greek typos, which means an imprint or an impression. So archetypes means the the impressions that have been made upon the psyche of living creatures a trillion times over, over a period of four billion years of life. And because the ones that are repeated endlessly, uh, you know, like sunrise, darkness, uh, um, uh, among mammalian creatures, male and female, and, and the other sort of relentlessly recurring experiences of life, these imprints are the archetypes within the psyche. And the, there is a, a central archetype, which Jung called the self, uh, a term that he borrowed from uh, Indian, mainly Hindu uh, philosophy. Uh, The self being, if one is in India and among Hindus, and you meet someone on the path and you put your hands together and you say namaste, which is I salute the self in you. So this central archetype, the self, is in the many, many ways that it can be represented artistically or in stories, is indistinguishable from the way that humans have represented images and stories of their gods. So it has, it is the center of the person as a whole. And coming back to the role of dreams, having laid out this sort of topography a bit, what 
Jung felt dreams were most clearly doing was because the center of consciousness, the I, ego, and consciousness can, well, because it doesn't really know its provenance from the self, it can get out of balance, it can get inflated, uh, it can believe it has um, powers, capabilities that it doesn't really have. And dreams are uh, just another one of the millions of feedback loops that exist in living creatures to keep the balance right. So if the blood sugar goes a bit too high, then a bit of insulin or glucagon will be produced, and if it goes too low, and so on. And we are, we are you know, literally engines with millions of feedback loops, and dreams are a balancing process in, in a, an analogous way. So they're a way of, of regulating the, the psyche and, and the, the self in its larger sense. Yeah, yeah. Or, or at any rate, that psyche that is truly centered upon the self is more regulating the part of the psyche which is centered upon the I, because that is the part that is most likely to get out of balance. So what then is is the role of the the analyst when the the patient or the client brings a, a dream and and there there is this uh, regulatory capacity maybe within this dream what, what is the role of the analyst and, and how do you work as an analyst in that case the therapeutic work altogether is one which I I hold this kind of vision of the relationship between ego, I, consciousness, and the, um, the greater sort of realm of the total person. Because everyone knows they haven't consciously concocted their own dreams. And if they're willing to pay a bit of attention to dreams, then they will know that the dreams are in some way uniquely connected to themselves as individuals. And that therefore makes it relatively easier to actually feel and believe that there is that within one which is playing a part in how one lives and how one is, and that one can relate to it and actually it's it's there with you all the time. Mm -hmm. And this even that recognition in itself can be very helpful to a lot of people. It, it produces less loneliness in existence and, uh, and also a, something where um, the whole range of feelings that are called sort of spiritual or religious can, kind of, can coalesce around and have a, a way of... Um, being less collective, more individual. So um, we uh, have, as you uh, mentioned at the start, a, a section called Dream of the Week. And so uh, Dave is going to read for us uh, a dream that's been sent in. And we thought it would be fun um, to hear you do a Jungian analysis of the dream and we'll sort of chip in from uh, the, our knowledge of not just Jung but perhaps our other approaches that we also use. And let's, let's see what happens. So I'm going to hand over to Dave. So the, the, the dream then is uh, it's from Heather in the UK. So Heather says, I was going to a show in London and it was one about the making of a show, how they did it, like the acrobat ones, which I don't know what she means by that, but it means something to her. It was a very strange theater, a modern arena with high, uh, steep high seats going up endlessly People were putting what I assumed were props in white, narrow cubicles, like those in gyms, but clean and polished, and I sat in a row on my own. So that's the initial setting. 
Then a huge cloth sheet came over us like a multicolored balloon. It was being pulled from below and moving over us all. But I thought, this is too hot and claustrophobic and taking too long. And I became frightened, so I decided to crawl out along the seats. Then I tried several of these lockers, but I didn't like any, and so I moved on. Everyone was busy setting up for the performance, putting stuff in, but there was nothing to see on the stage. Lockers opened from behind the auditorium, but I expected them to open onto the stage, but they didn't. It's not very useful, I thought. At the end of the lockers, sitting at a table was a famous actress having tea. I decided to stay and talk as I thought this is much better. I complimented her on her career and she said, you have had a good career too, but not on the stage. Enough, I thought. And so it was then outside, the, the dream switched to being outside. So it gets more hazy here as I know I wanted to get home, but I'm not sure how I did it. I think this was a lucid dream or parts of it were as I made decisions to leave my seat and look in cubicles, but at the end I felt I was drifting home. Okay, end of dream? End of dream. And she says a little mm. bit about uh, the, some of the feelings. She said, I, I admit I felt confused and almost frustrated by this dream. I wanted a nice dream and a night out. She said in the background there's lots of stress and, and maybe that's what the lockers are about, trying to put things out of the way and, and have a break from it all. So that's her, her interpretation. I mean, my, my immediate thoughts are uh, wondering what age she is and where she is in her life and what her career has been. But anyway, those are, let's just accept those are unknowns. I, I can suppose. answer part of that. I know that she's just, uh, she's uh, about 60 and right. has retired from uh, quite a successful uh, professional career as a scientist. Oh, okay, right, right. Um, well, my a thought that came to me listening to the first um, paragraph uh, was life's not a rehearsal. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of going to a show which is about, it's a show about how the show is going to be made, uh, feels a little bit like the that bit of wisdom that is encapsulated in that phrase, life is not a rehearsal, you know, that mm -hmm. actually it's a good thing to realise one's in it, time mm -hmm. has an arrow and you're going to be dead at some point, so just get stuck in. Mm -hmm. um, the multicoloured cover, the like a sort of a thin balloon rubber that's being pulled over all the seats which go up endlessly high. Um, although I somehow didn't get a sense of, of there being anyone else there much except her alone in a row. Uh, but she did say it's being pulled over us. Yeah. yeah. Suppose there were other people in the audience. This is a, it, it quite a strange image. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would want to um, I would want to ask her just you know whether it's brought her any associations, uh, thoughts, uh, things that she has experienced that are anything like it, um, because in the immediate moment I I wouldn't know quite where to go with that except that it sounds rather suffocating and frightening. It that, does, doesn't that drew it? my attention as well. Yeah, yeah that, that whatever it is, whatever it reminds her of, the experience is of it being hot and, and stifling yeah. underneath there. Yeah. It's yeah. Too, mu too much for her, whatever it is. I think uh, Dave and I often work with something that we call the wake waking dream technique, which is something that's been developed here at the DRI. It'd be something I'd like to locate those emotions and those sensations in her body uh, just to see what happens in the body when you actively work with, with those. Mm 
It's yeah. what, I think what Jung would call active imagination. We, we mm. often get people to talk through their dream and locate the emotional felt sense in the body. Yeah, yeah. No, he, it, that, you are right. It is, uh, he would call that active imagination. And, and in, in relation to that, you know, it, it, it did occur to me listening or hearing the images it's a multicolored um, rubbery thing. The show she, for some reason, connects with uh, rehearsals of acrobatics. One can certainly sort of focus on the suffocating part of the threat. But it, it, I, I would also be curious, because it's going to raise the heat, and because the dream is dealing with bodies in certain postures, now, you know, if one feels one's body getting hot and there are people half-dressed going into various postures, I think the whole area of, of sexual arousal might be in there. And mm -hmm. if she wants to crawl out of it, uh, I suppose I would be wondering, but I mean, I would know if I know, knew the person, but not knowing her, I would wonder whether there was some anxiety to do with being overtaken by sexual passion or uh, er erotic or emotional passions. Mm. That's an interesting, an yeah. interesting take. One always thinks of Freud once we start talking of sexuality more than Jung, so it's quite interesting hearing you say that. Yeah. Maybe... We being the two of you, I don't always think of <laughs> probably more talking about <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh What did you make of the lockers out of interest? I thought they were quite interesting how the, she was worried that they, you know, that they, what did she say? They opened from behind and she thought they were going to open onto the stage. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I've got the sense that she well, wanted them to. She's not, yes. Yeah, yeah I... I'm a little bit hampered because I'm not a, a gym uh, frequenter, <laughs> so I don't really know what gym lockers look like. I had so I had to kind of replace that with lost luggage of lockers in my mind. Uh, the idea of lockers opening onto a stage, I mean, as far as I know, that isn't a thing that happens, but maybe it is. I mean, I. I can only say I, I would have to really ask her to explain those parts of the dream and then just see where where it took us. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, in in a, in a generic way, lockers are for putting things that one is going to want to use. You don't want to get rid of them, but nor do you want to carry them around all the time. So you you need to have a space where you can put it and retrieve it when wanted, which is in many ways like memory. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, that's a really interesting uh, interpretation or analysis of that image because I think that's probably very appropriate when we think of what uh, uh, Heather has checked in at the end. That some, you know. Yeah, wanting to put something away uh, for now mm. and, mm. Uh, and just put it aside, but but not discard it entirely. It yeah, and if, you know, if that, if there is something to do with uh, mental retrieval memory, uh, and, you know, the, the dream, as you say, the setting of it is to do with her going to a theatre and seeing a, a show, and if she wanted the lockers to open onto the stage, so then I would be wondering about the stage being her uh, consciousness mm -hmm. and um, the fact that she is disturbed about the lockers not opening onto the stage, and therefore the actors can't retrieve things as easily. I suppose I would wonder whether this was a person who was beginning to worry about not being able to remember things as well as they used to. 
Mm. Very interesting idea. Yeah. Mm. And the uh, and the famous actress that she sits and has tea with. Is this do do either of you know whether this is a known person or just the dream makes it a famous actress who she doesn't isn't a real person, as it were? She, she hasn't said. No, she hasn't said. That's a very good question, actually, because back to what would you associate with that famous person if we knew who it was would be quite an interesting avenue for exploration. Uh, we just yeah. have, I think it's just a dream actress here that's deemed as being famous. Well, maybe. Um, I mean, I'd, I would be more inclined to guess that this would be someone who is... A known real person, with for whom the dreamer has some kind of uh, interest or connection or admiration or something, um, and that that you know pursuing that would, as you say, um, really develop that whole bit of the fabric of the dream. But if if we do just you know, assume that it isn't a known real actress, but for some reason is is presented in the dream as being a famous actress. Well, the dream seems the moment that the famous actress says, well, you've had a, a, a very splendid career too, she seems to get pissed off with the actress. <laughs> and says, well, that's enough of that, and we walk out. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, yeah, she particularly says, you, you've had a good career too, but not on the stage. And I wonder yeah. about the, the tone and oh, the feeling of that oh. phrase. Yes, good point, good point. Yeah, so maybe she would have liked a bit more being admired by audiences, the streamer, mm. um, and has felt that her success and her life has all been, you know, not very much recognised and admired by millions of people. Or even the community that she's worked in. It doesn't have to be a big stage as such, but the, uh, that's well, not really... The, the fact it is a famous actress does rather suggest a bigger stage that True. she would have liked. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how much... Having been a doctor and worked for some period in academic medicine, I can assure you that there are scientists who love fame and fortune. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wonder with with uh, Heather, uh, the, the dreamer here as well, that whether she has a sense of being center stage in, in her own life. There's something about going to this performance, and it's something mm. I've seen with clients that it, you know, temporarily or, uh, or or habitually in life, one can feel like the action is elsewhere or that one's in a supporting role, and yeah. that doesn't sit well with with the the kind of the the egoic center at least, which wants yeah. very much to feel like it's center stage. Absolutely, very very. Very good point. And uh, if I were beginning work with this person and she brought that dream, now you've made me aware of it, it that's certainly something I would be wanting to uh, explore. Yeah, you because know, as you say, it is, it's a common feeling that almost mm -hmm. anyone can get at some times. I mean, there aren't many people who go through all their time every day feeling that they are the most important thing around and they're never missing out on anything. No, well, that would be somewhat inflated, I guess, wouldn't it? It, it would. It would. <laughs> that would be an inflation by the soul. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today, Roderick. I really appreciate you taking it. the time. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Very nice. There's, there's so much more we could ask you, but, but thank you very much. Roderick, thank you very much for joining us. It's been lovely to meet and uh, learn more about the Jungian uh, approach to dreaming, and uh, thank you. Well, as I say, I've enjoyed it, so thank you too. Bye for now. Bye for now. Take care. Well, that was a lovely conversation with, with <laughs> Roderick, and... Um, um, perhaps we'll have him back again sometime. If there's more to ask about on the, the, the Jungian perspective and uh, Roderick's writings on the subject are, uh, are fascinating as well and uh, are available online. And we'll also put some links to them in the show notes. So uh, there we go. Thanks very much indeed. Sweet dreams. 
Keep dreaming and keep sharing your dreams. So, thank you for joining us for this week's episode. Don't forget to like us and leave comments on your favourite podcast platform. As I'm sure you know, that's the way we build an audience for the Dreamboat podcast and also to spread news about dreaming. And as we said, there are many ways you can share your dreams at the DRI, the Dream Research Institute. Yes, we have courses, events and workshops, and we want to hear from you. So check out the show note for links or find us on Instagram as the Dreamboat Podcast, on our Facebook page as Dreamboat Podcast, on Twitter as at Dreamboat Pod, or come and find us at dricpe.org.uk. That's dricpe.org.uk. And you can email us on drinfo at ccpe.org.uk. Once again, that's d-r-i-i-n-f-o at ccpe.org.uk. And if you want to explore your dreams further or would like to support us, you can join the DRI as a member for just £10 a year. Yes, £10 a year. As a member, you will get discounts for our events and short courses. You'll get our newsletter with the latest dream research news. And we will also be adding other special member benefits during the year. Of course, members' dreams will always be given preference for reading on the podcast Dream of the Week slot. This low offer of £10 membership will last through to the end of June 2023. So go to the link on the show notes and become a DRI member today. Keep dreaming and keep sharing your dreams. Dreams.